Open your eyes. Breath of the Wild, a Zelda game released back in 2017, has been making notes not the pants ever since with the amazing open world, characters, storyline, freedom, and more. I just got done playing this beautiful game, clocking in around 65 hours, which is nuts. I'm used to playing games with half the time I put in, but the time I spend in this game just breezed through. For example, on the website How Long To Beat, the main story takes about 50 hours to complete, and I spent about 15 hours extra on it. And that's just the beauty of this game, which is the absolute freedom I have to do whatever I want. Normally in video games, I'm trying to finish the main story as quick as possible because that's all I care about. But with Breath of the Wild, there was so much to do and sometimes I spent my time doing nothing. I'm being dead serious by the way. Normally I'm not one to care for the atmosphere that much, but there were times in between me traveling to villages and doing side quests that I would sometimes stop, hear the calming, gentle music in the background and stare at this guy. Take this from a guy who usually doesn't do this kind of stuff. Go for it. It was time well spent and I would do it all over again. There were also times in which I would get really involved with things, such as cooking hearty meals to help me in my journey. I'm saying that 9 times out of 10, I would let the same animation play of the food cooking, whether good or bad. There was such a joy that I got from that, from learning which meals didn't go together, to which ones did, how to make elixirs, and more. The freedom in this game is unmatched. Normally in games, there are a set number of ways you can complete missions and objectives. However, in this game, there was truly no wrong answer. For instance, in shrines, you can complete them the way the developers intended, or make up your own way that works for you to get to the same destination. You're also free to take out and dispose of enemy camps how you wish, whether you prefer to brawl with them, use bombs and arrows to protect yourself, or smash them with the power of your mind, aka Magnesis. Even in the comment section of some YouTube videos, I've seen comments of people talking about how they spend most of their time doing side quests, completing their map, or just cooking. This also adds to the list of reasons of why this game is great, and it makes it easy to recommend to people, especially those that never played a game of Zelda, like me, or have never gone outside of their comfort zone. What I love about Breath of the Wild is that it doesn't require you to have played the other games in the series to have an understanding with this one, or have a good time. Two examples I can think of are Danganronpan 2 and Kingdom Hearts 2. As much as I love these games, like they're literally in my top 5 of favourite games ever, that is a downside of them. Spoilers for these coming up, they tend to bring up events or even past characters into the games that can be daunting for someone who is new and trying to get into those respective series. Back to Breath of the Wild. This game reminded me why I usually space my time playing games because it got me obsessed. So much so to the point that I would sometimes be at social events with friends and family or even at work and all I would think about was playing this game. If I was playing this game, I was loving it. If I wasn't, I was obsessed and thinking of new ways of how to play it, how to solve shrines, explore and get better at combat. I feel like any good piece of art, regardless of the medium, should be memorable and have you obsessed about it, which is what this beauty did to me. A nice and yet backhanded mechanic that the game had was the Blood Moon. No, 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 no! Oh goodness gracious, no! Don't do this to me now! Please, I promise I'll be a good boy! As the skies start to become red and black, and as Zelda starts to tell you to be on your guard, you better prepare to fight to the death. They nailed this mechanic. I remembered it horrifying me, especially on my first time. During this time period, past enemies that you have slain before come back to life. So if you go out during nighttime, low on health, food, weapons, or anything else, then you're screwed. On the other hand, this can work in your favor if you are prepared and or have a decent amount of playtime in this world. You can use this to your advantage by farming for more enemy guts and weapons. One of the scariest parts of this game was the Shrouded Shrine quest. This was absolutely terrifying. So much so that I actually walked slowly as Link as if I were in the exact same position he was. 99% of the time, it was pitch dark, enemies would come out of nowhere, your torch would go out with one wrong press of a button, and oh, that damn he knocks. Seeing that thing and the ball hanging around its neck in the dark genuinely had me shook. In terms of atmosphere, I'd say that's one of the best cases in which the game showcases it. I've got to give a quick shout out to the YouTuber Internet Pitstop. He's an amazing creator who's made me think about the atmosphere in games, 
and other minute details in media. Let's talk about the Blight Ganons. These guys are four demonic beasts which are created out of malice by our main antagonist, Calamity Ganon. These guys make up our main bosses, including Ganondorf, I mean Ganondorf, or Calamity Ganon in this case. Within the main context of the story, they seize control of the Divine Beasts of Hyrule, then they kill the four champions, which I will get to soon. With the four Black Ganons, we've got Wind Black Ganon, Thunder Black Ganon, Fire Black Ganon, and Water Black Ganon. Due to the vastness of the land in this game, there is no right or wrong order in which to encounter these spawns of Satan, I mean Ganon. Although, that being said, some of these douches are definitely harder than the others. The order I went through was Thunder Black Ganon, Wind Black Ganon, Water Black Ganon, and Lucky Fire Black Ganon for last. If I had to give a recommendation to anyone playing the game, don't pick Thunder Black Ganon first, because bloody hell this bastard gave me a fight and a half. Everything from his movement and attack speed to the patterns had me all the way messed up. Though, there is a major upside to this. If you manage to beat him early on, it'll make the rest of the boss fights a cinch. Wind Blight was definitely the easiest out of the four, being much slower than Thunder Blight Ganon and not as aggressive, or at least in my playthrough of the game. Water Blight was harder than Wind Blight, but that's not saying much. Although once the platform on the battlefield started to shift around and you had to swim around and not get hit by the ice cubes, it definitely added to the difficulty of the boss fight. Last up, we've got Fire Blight Ganon. Screw this guy. He was just as aggressive as Thunder Blight and thankfully a bit slower than him. I am ashamed to say that I missed the cue to chuck the bum into the sky once he makes a giant fireball. All in all, they did make for good fun and a nice introduction to the Legend of Zelda series. Next up, we've got the Divine Beast. Getting to see the introduction of each beast, the champion that inhabited him and them be freed was a nice touch. I will admit that I didn't like the puzzles that much on each of them, but that's more me being lost than anything. You ever think sometimes that the world is against you and some people are pure evil? Well, this is how I felt when I encountered my first Lionel in the Zora domain. Bro, these things look like if you mix Satan and a Senator together. I heard about them before, but seeing one up and close was truly terrifying my brothers and sisters. In this mission, at the Zora domain, you're supposed to go collect some arrows at a nearby mountain for the upcoming Divine Beast. Initially, I thought, no problem, what's the worst that could happen? Lesson learned, never ask a stupid question like that ever again. Every time I tried sneaking past this Lionel to get to the arrows, it would somehow see me from the other side of the planet or have superhuman hearing. I didn't find it out till way later, but apparently this is the only Lionel that is this hostile towards you. The rest are territorial and will usually give you a grace period of around 30 seconds to get out of their way before they send you to see the Lord. So me being me, I decided screw this and decided to tango with this large abomination to society. And yeah, I got my ass whipped. Like plenty of times before I came even close to beating it. I'm pretty sure I spent about an hour, 30 minutes to two hours trying to beat this thing. It was actually pretty simple too. But the thing is, putting the theory into place was another thing. Assuming you didn't have max hearts, this thing would one hit KO you or leave you with a heart left. On top of that, every dodge and flurry rush had to be perfect. And you would also have to have a bunch of weapons on deck, because if you didn't, let's just say your death will be swiftly guaranteed. However, I will say that beating the Lionel is so freaking satisfying. To put in context for you guys, the Lionels are harder than the main boss, yes I'm talking about Calamity Ganon, but I'll get to him another time. A problem I had with this game lies within its game mechanics. It's the fact that the left joystick which you use to move in this game is the same one in which you use when doing a perfect dodge. So imagine my surprise when I've almost beaten this line all for the first time only to lose due to the same mechanic having me crouch instead. Yeah, fun times those were. Next up, we have the four champions of Breath of the Wild. In no particular order, we've got Rivali, Urbosa, Daruk, and Mifa. These guys were a group of the chosen ones from their respective races to help battle against Calamity Ganon. I love their different designs and personalities. It is a shame we didn't get to fight with them, understandably, but we did get to see the flashbacks and get to know their descendants and modern day equivalents. Mifa is an absolute angel and wifey if I've ever seen it. She's beautiful, compassionate, and has this aura of grace to her, which doesn't feel forced. It's nice to see that reflected in her power 
Mephis Grace. This allows you to be revived from what would be certain death and to gain some extra temporary hearts on top of that. Getting to see her brother and her dad was amazing. Legit, if there was ever a buddy up type of game or some type of DLC, Sidon has to be in it. He was so sweet to Link from the moment he met him, was an absolute wingman, although it being for a dead chick, Mifa, and having absolute faith in us being able to take down Water Black Cannon. The Zora Domain had a beautiful look to it, with the different types of blue used in the bridges and the water. There were also these stone tablets right outside the domain, which talked about the line orb before we saw it, and the scar which King Dorofan, Sidon's dad, received on his forehead as a result of a battle which came to be viewed as a badge of honor. It was amazing getting to read this, because it had a payoff for these things once we got to see them come to fruition. The Zora Domain and its people are easily my favorites within the entire game. Next up, we've got Goron City and its champion, Daruk. Daruk was easily the most fun champion to learn about and get to know. His simple, upbeat attitude and straightforwardness made him an easy character to like. His gift to Link, Daruk's protection, was such a clutch move to have, especially in the later game when enemies would start to get harder and more numerous. Yunobo is his modern day descendant, and damn, this guy is useless. He's lovable, but useless at the same time. This big fat baby got himself stuck in a cave and made us do that escort mission because who doesn't love escort missions in video games? Am I right? Ah, I love my life. Bluto is the elder chief of Goron City and he's badass looking while also being very old. I love how the game respects him and humanizes him at the same time too. All the way from his introduction to Yonobo getting his painkillers and to him not being able to join us anyways. Goron City has an amazing interconnected look with all these rocky mountains and village-like huts. Their culture is big on working very hard and being on the grind, whether it be at the mines, making food or clothes, they're doing it all. While the Zora domain is still my favorite, this was a nice change of pace from it. Moving on, we've got the Rito domain. First off, can we say, screw Rivali. Whenever I was in that domain, this ugly bird kept giving Link flack because he couldn't fly and because he had the Master Sword. That being said, Rivali's Gale, his ability, was arguably the most useful thing in the game. Honestly, the amount of times I abused this thing was ungodly. It made traversing the map a breeze. It helped me get out of or into shrines, towers, away from mass amounts of enemies, and more. The modern day version of Rivali was Terra, and he was a cool dude. He had the same pride Rivali did about being a warrior and such, but he was open to helping us and moving the story forward. The Rito domain felt a bit smaller than the last two that I mentioned. However, it makes up for it with the homey atmosphere that it gives off. It felt like I could fly around this place or sit up at the top of it without a care in the world. The funny thing is that when I first got into the Rito domain, I ended up coming in from the wrong way this side. But within the context of the game, it works out really well with the freedom it has going for it. The last domain I'll be talking about is the Gerudo Town. This area focuses more on minimalism and the laid back feeling similar to the Rito Village. This is a place of all women and the only way we get to sneak in is to get a clothing set in a nearby village which makes us look like a woman. Let's get on with the obvious. Damn! All these women are hurt. When I first made it in, I felt like I was a few steps away from becoming Johnny Bravo. <laughs> For those that don't know, my type of women that I prefer are brown skinned girls from light skin to dark skin and are somewhat short. Urbosa was a champion of Gerudo and her ability, Ubosa's Fury, helped to deal mass amounts of damage to enemies and sometimes hit a bunch of them at once. Urbosa was also the coolest of the champions with her aesthetic combining a mix of her femininity and her warrior-like attributes. Every time she was in a cutscene, it was made better because of her. She's definitely up there with Daruk as some of the most fun characters in the show. Her descendant Riju is the Gerudo chief and charming character. Not only is she my type in a nutshell, she has this great mix of authority and playfulness. I even left the Thunderhelm alone after being done with the town because in the context of the story, it felt wrong having Link take away this prized possession of the city. Also, can we give the Yiga clan a bunch of middle fingers please? These guys were a constant pain in my backside. I remembered first hearing about them from a traveling lady while making my way somewhere in the grassy lands. She was telling me that there were a group of people who used to serve the royal family, but have now sworn their allegiance to Ganon. 
It wasn't until this lady said something along the lines of, we're dedicated to defeating a hero, thought long dead, that I realized that they were talking about me and that I was in deep trouble. I also found out upon some further research that it was a guy who said this, but my point still remains the same. This was an amazing turning point for the game as it kept me on my toes and forced me to pay attention when that red cloud and damned music plays. Don't even get me started on infiltrating their hideout. Oh my days, this was horrible. Because this was one of those cases that if you were caught by any one of the members, their entire clan would come and swarm you. Trust me, I tried fighting them off, but they kept coming one after the other. I think I mentioned it slightly earlier, but the music in this game is so damn beautiful. Everything from traveling from town to town during the boss fights and cutscenes. Speaking of cutscenes, the ones in this game looked so damn beautiful. I'm talking about like movie like quality. It almost felt like I was watching a Ghibli film at certain points in the story, which added a nice change of pace and allowed me to mellow out and enjoy the scenery. Another thing that detracted from my enjoyment of the game was the shrines. At first, it felt cool to explore and find them. However, the more you progress through the game, it became more of a chore and just a means to filling out your heart containers and stamina vessels. The game allows for you to choose either with the benefits and downsides. Having more hearts makes combat and surviving near falls much easier. The downside of it is that if you suck at combat like I did in the beginning, then your extra hearts would have been in vain. I chose the stamina vessels and boy did they pay off big time. They made swimming, climbing, running much more efficient which allowed me to travel the world much better and allowed me to have a great time. The ancient guardians were a great touch with them being created by the Sheikah clan and to see them gone rogue in this game was a sight to see. Some of them were still, some of them were stuck to the ground and were trying to beam me into the next life. The scariest versions were definitely the ones who were running around the map randomly. When I first saw one near the fields of Hyrule Castle, I almost pissed myself due to how unexpected it was. The Master Sword was cool. There's no way you could trash on it. This weapon never breaks, has a smooth design, and does dual damage towards the end of the game, particularly against Ganondorf. I will admit that I cheated this part with the glitch. Thank goodness for that. Otherwise, the boss fight at the end and the Lionels would have been complete and utter hell. I also liked how the dialogue would change in this game based on the situation happening. For instance, when Link gets the attire to enter Gerudo Town, the guy out front doesn't recognize him at all, and the guards are much more warmer and receptive to him, or should I say her, entering the city. Another case was really early on in which Link woke up from his sleep. I remember taking out a wooden branch in front of the old man outside of the Shrine of Resurrection and seeing him almost have a heart attack from me pulling out the weapon near him was hilarious and realistic. This was also one of the few games, if any, that I didn't mind doing the side quests because getting the dialogue to change, getting closer to the characters was a nice treat to this whole adventure. That being said, I haven't completed all the side quests in this game. One of my favorite side quests was from Kariko Village in which I had Link show his finesse with a bow and arrows for a shopkeeper who's deprived of that from her husband. Now, every time I go into a store, she's extra friendly, refers positively about the type of man I am, still talks about that time. Another one was when I eliminated an entire base of bow coblins and a few moblins outside near the beach of Hateno village. This was all because this young girl on a farm asked me to get rid of them in order to keep her animals safe. After they're taken care of, the way she talks to you changes and it made me feel more inclined to do the other side quests in order to get a similar response. I also loved the atmosphere at Hyrule Castle with how terrifying everything was and how frantic the music got. It definitely added to the feeling of this is the end of the journey for you. While we're talking about this, I gotta say, Calamity Ganon is one of the most underwhelming bosses that I've fought in a long, long time. I've heard people saying this on Reddit and YouTube comments, but I didn't bother to pay them any mind. Genuinely, if you know how to beat Lionel, which you should at this stage, then the final boss fight is much easier in comparison. The champions and divine beasts eradicate half of Ganon's health in the first stage. Then, he starts to use the abilities and moves of all the blights you fought thus far. It made for a nice callback, but also really predictable boss battle. Then, the stage after was even easier. You're given the most OP bow ever, a pony, and plenty of time. Seriously, I missed the main spots so many times and won on the stage on my first go, which made me feel like all the battles and experiences I went through 
went with it. That being said, the art style and music of these stages were absolutely amazing. Don't get it twisted. I also know that Meef is wifey, but Zelda got that cake. Now I see why Link put up with her BS so much. There were also cool elemental dragons flying around everywhere, which was super cool. I never really interacted with them, but instead watched them as if they were live art pieces, and also because they partly terrified me. All in all, this game was absolutely amazing. I've had a friend tell me that if I loved this, then I would love Tears of the Kingdom. So I've decided to put that on my list and hopefully get around to it eventually. I've just got some other games that I want to play first beforehand. Thank you for all you beautiful people who decided to watch this video of mine. I had a great time playing this game and I hope you guys enjoyed this video as much as I did making it. Thank you guys for watching. This is Black Sugar Lovin' out.